Georg Zemmel was born in Berlin in 1858. His father ran a successful chocolate factory but died when George was 16, leaving a considerable inheritance, making it easier for him to pursue his studies in philosophy and history. He taught philosophy, psychology and sociology at the University of Berlin and was close to Max Weber. Together with Weber and Ferdinand Ternis, was a co-founder of the German Society for Sociology. He was always an outsider to German academic circles, partly because he wrote for a broader general public in magazines and newspapers, as well as for other academics in journal articles and books. Simmel drew on Weber's concern with meaning and interaction, but placed it more centrally in his analyses. If you look at most textbooks and accounts of the classical theorists in sociology, they tend to talk mostly about Marx, Durkheim and Weber, leaving Simmel out. By including Simmel, I'm trying to say something about how important his work is to complement the other three. Although you get some discussion of social interaction in Weber, you get a lot more of it in Simmel, who pursued that line of argument in a much more interesting way. He's often presented as a bit lightweight, talking about less serious topics like fashion or love, and that's why he's tended to be excluded from the pantheon of classical theorists that everyone has to know. But my own view is that a student of sociology does need to become as familiar with Zimmel as with Marx, Durkheim and Weber. Students also tend to like his work, often more than that of the other three. Zimmel pushed the argument about interaction to the point where he was critical of concepts like social structure and social system. He argued that there's no such thing as society, there are only people interacting with each other. He believed that one has to look at the fabric of the way people connect up with each other if one is to understand what the social is all about. Zimmel wasn't very keen on using concepts like society as a driving concept in sociological analysis. He argued that you have to look at society not as a structure or a system, but as a web of interactions between people. If you were to visualise it, it would look a bit like this. Social forms, to use the term that Zimmel was more attracted to, don't exist as if they were things that stay the same over time. They have to be constantly remade by human beings in their interactions with each other. Durkheim's conception of the sociological imagination is to emphasise the ways in which society and social institutions exist prior to any individual's entry to the world and how individuals have to adapt to society and not the other way around. Zimmel responded to that by saying, well, that's only partially true. To some extent, we have to constantly remake those social institutions, and the fact that it generally happens more or less automatically without us thinking about it consciously doesn't mean that it's not the case. The examples that get used to demonstrate that are points of quite dramatic social and political change. One could refer to the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 as an example of how a social system, a society, a political and economic system that appeared to be solidly entrenched in the world, having a firm existence since the end of the Second World War in 1945, with no likelihood that it would change to any significant degree, suddenly seemed to dissolve. A whole society, an entire state, appeared to disappear before our eyes. That example, the case study of the disappearance of the German Democratic Republic in 1989, is an example of what Zimmel was trying to say, that without constant reproduction of the social order, without the active participation of people in all the different aspects of the way a society is organised, it doesn't continue, it can just fall apart. Another kind of example is the fate of the Roman Catholic monasteries in England. I'll quote from the opening passage of Simon Markinson's recent article on higher education. In 1529, the greater monasteries of England and the nearly 400 smaller monastic establishments looked very strong. They were doubly protected by universal belief and by a multitude of material connections into English society, the economy, politics and the court. They were essential to daily life in many localities. Monasteries were centres of farming and craft production, sources of community welfare and way stations for travellers across the land. They provided valued careers for younger sons. Cathedrals loomed over the landscape. Holders of vast wealth and power, the monasteries could not be touched. Ten years later, they were gone, and the English found other ways of being religious. As Marginson points out, nothing lasts forever, and every so often nation states and societies discover that they can live without the institutions they have inherited. The institutions disappear, and their functions are picked up elsewhere. An important practical question then is, is it possible for institutions that we think are very well established, highly unlikely to change, actually to be quite fragile and unstable? Is it possible that they could dissolve from one day to the next? One could argue that the global financial crisis in 2008 was an example of the world coming very close to that. Zimmer was basically raising the question of exactly how stable institutions are. 
who's a theorist one looks to then to think about how important it is to look at the interactions that we all engage in constantly reproducing recreating social institutions rather than starting with the institutions and then looking at how individuals fit into them. Another aspect of Zimmel's approach is that it's important to think in terms of social types of individuals as expressions of particular social forms, a vice chancellor, a student, a lecturer, a politician, a queen, a manager and so on. Instead of thinking of the particular human being that happens to be president or prime minister, one considers what all presidents or all prime ministers are expected to do and to be. This is the foundation of the concept of role, looking at what is expected of anyone in that position, what pressures are exerted on the person in that position, what relationships they have with other individuals in a particular social network, how all of that will elicit a certain kind of behaviour. Simmel's own example is that of the stranger, which he analysed as a particular kind of role that people play that has a certain function in social relationships. He pointed out that the stranger is both part of society and outside of it at the same time. The stranger is present in society, so not an outsider in that sense. They are both in the social world and outside of it simultaneously. Many of us play that role as a matter of course without thinking about it, and it's certainly a role that you play when you move from one country to another, from one cultural and social context to another. You're immediately a stranger in the sense that you're outside some aspects of that society, but you also still have to become part of it in other respects. It's possible to feel a stranger in one's own family. Some people will have grown up with the suspicion that they must have been adopted. One can certainly be a stranger at school. Many children feel that they're very different from everyone else at their school with a distinctive way of thinking and feeling. It's been said that it helps enormously to have the sensibility of a stranger to be a sociologist. You have to have some sense of being outside of social institutions, social norms, in order to be able to analyse and think about them. The very process of developing a critical sociological imagination takes you outside the society you're in. Zimmer was also concerned to analyse the form, the geometry and the grammar of social life, to look at the structure of social relationships as having a certain logic to them. The concepts of form, geometry and grammar are more fully developed in later sociological theory, but he was the first person to argue along these lines. This is how he explained it. Although there is little similarity between the behaviour displayed at the court of Louis XIV and that displayed in the main offices of an American corporation, a study of the forms of subordination and superordination in each will reveal underlying patterns common to both. Zimmel argued that one can see similar kinds of logics at play in different social groupings that at first glance look as though they ought to be completely different. A royal court might seem to be completely different from, say, Apple, but if you look closely at the structure of social relationships, if you look at the logic of how people relate to one another, then you find that there are important similarities. So Tim Cook's relationship with everyone else at Apple has similarities to that of any king or queen and their courtiers. One useful formula is that one can go about learning about doctors by studying plumbers and about prostitutes by studying psychiatrists. In summary, first, Zimmel emphasised how society depends on social interactions between people and how social institutions require constant remaking by human beings. Second, laying the foundations of the concept of role, he argued that it's important to understand how human behaviour is organised in particular social types and that the logic of social interaction is often best understood in terms of those social types. The example he used was that of the stranger. Zimmel was also concerned to identify the geometry and grammar of social forms so that situations that appear to be quite different from each other can often have very similar underlying structures and logics.